Welcome to the first in a two-part series in which we cover the basics of corneal transplant. Before this lecture, you should be familiar with the anatomy of the cornea. At the end of this lecture, you should understand the difference between full thickness and partial thickness graphs, describe the various types of corneal transplants, appreciate how a corneal transplant is performed, and understand the relative advantages and disadvantages between full thickness and partial thickness graphs. As we know, the cornea consists of five layers. Simply speaking, corneal transplants can be thought of as full thickness, in which all five layers of the cornea are replaced, also known as penetrating keratoplasty, or partial thickness, in which some of the layers are replaced, also known as a lamellar keratoplasty. Some common indications for corneal transplants in our center include Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, keratoconus, and stromal dystrophies such as granular corneal dystrophy. Penetrating keratoplasties were the dominant form of corneal transplant since the 1960s to the early part of the century, restoring vision to many with corneal conditions. However, some of the problems associated with EKs include poor long-term survival rates of 50 to 60% at 10 years, wound-related problems such as traumatic wound rupture, infection, and astigmatism, as well as graft rejection. With advances in surgical instrumentation and techniques, targeted lamellar replacement is an emerging concept in corneal transplantation today. In this, only the disease portion of cornea is replaced. Lamellar keratoplasty can be anterior or posterior for endothelial diseases. Examples of anterior lamellar keratoplasty include automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty or ALTK, predecimetic ALK, and decimetic ALK. ALTK is performed for disease affecting the superficial cornea in the first 200 microns or so. It evolves using the microkeratome to create a flap of the desired depth in the first stage. The flap, which is of a large diameter and is sometimes slightly irregular, is replaced and left to heal. In the second stage, undertaken a few months later, the trephination is performed within the original flap, and the flap of the predetermined depth is removed. The donor cornea, which is also cut with the microkeratome, is then placed on the recipient and sutured in place. Deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, or DALC, can be considered as predecimetic, in which some stroma is left behind, or decimetic, in which the stroma is completely removed. In 1985, Aquila described modification of deep lamellar dissection, in which air was injected on a 26 gauge needle just anterior to the decime membrane to achieve separation between the decime and the stroma. Although successful in some cases, this was however associated with incomplete separation and high rates of perforation. In 2002, Anwar described the big bubble technique in which trephination to 60 or 80% corneal depth was performed, followed by use of a 27 to 30 gauge needle to inject air to obtain a bubble, seen by the stroma turning semi-opaque or white. At SNEC, we perform a modification of that technique. First, we use the tanatrophine to delineate a depth of 250 to 300 microns, and use a crescent blade to dissect that initial layer of cornea off. Next, we use a 30 gauge needle to create an entry point and then insert a special dark cannula to inject air. After the big bubble is obtained, the remaining stroma is dissected off, usually in quadrants, before the donor cornea is sutured in place over the recipient site. Anterior lamellar keratoplasty can be performed for therapeutic reasons, such as in this case of severe fungal infection that was not responding to medical treatment. However, more commonly is performed for optical reasons. 
such as stromal dystrophies, as you see in this case here, as well as for keratoconus, which may have failed more conservative forms of treatment, such as rigid gas permeable lenses. The advantages of ALK over PK include, number one, longer graph survival. As you can see in these survival curves, the green line which denotes ALK has a better survival in the short and long term as compared to PK, which is denoted by the blue line. Additionally, because of the retention of the healthy host endothelium, there's also a lower risk of rejection. Other advantages include shorter use of topical steroids. Typically in ALKs, we will use it for six months. And as a result, you have reduced risk of attendant complications such as glaucoma or infections. ALK also confers greater technotonic strength to the eye as compared to PK. However, some disadvantages include longer surgical time, especially in an initial learning curve, which is steeper than that for PK. And it involves possible conversion to PK if intraoperative complications such as decimate membrane perforation occur. Also, it doesn't get rid of problems such as astigmatism, suture-related problems, or infective keratitis. This concludes the first part of the talk on corneal graph basics. In the second part, we will deal more with endothelial keratoplasty. Thank you for listening.